good evening to all of you we are uh, about to start today's proceedings and uh, as many of you would know this is the first of the events that the center for urban studies and urban lab is initiating and this is our first conversation which is happening in the online mode the center the center for urban studies and urban lab is conceived of as a center allied with the school of international relations and politics at the mahatma gandhi university in kerala so welcome to the programs that the center will initiate from today onwards and uh, we hope that uh, most of you who have joined today would eventually also be part of this network the center is conceived of in the context of an increasing contemporary importance of working with and through urban formations city plans uh, urban typologies everyday life all of the themes which are uh, very much significant uh, in the context that we are living in pedagogically as well it has become necessary to think and to do research with urban processes in the context of political and social scenarios that can neither be called local nor be termed global because of the hybridities of themes subjects in social science analysis and intervention so this is because urban spaces exemplify such scenarios in stark relief we will have a working plan eventually that goes into themes like genealogies of cities character of urban spaces possibilities and limits of cities the past present and future of urban spaces city in relation to other cities today we have a very good friend who have agreed who has agreed to give the first in our conversations dennis dennis uh, has been into uh, urban research for quite a while and uh, it's very interesting that she goes along not only with urban studies but has gone into such significant themes like ecology uh, curatorial work which is a very challenging way of presenting the aspects that you're dealing with when you talk about urban urban spaces and urban spatiality and uh, this particular talk uh, comes in the aftermath of cypriot cyprus cypriot economic crisis in 2013 and the mounting pressure of public debt on the cypriot government that triggered multiple violent construction projects primarily on the coastal city of uh, lemesos i wouldn't uh, talk for more uh, i'm very happy that uh, denise has agreed to give her uh, give her ideas and share her ideas in our series of conversations and uh, thank you very much for all the listeners and please take care uh, not to turn on the audio button the video button is fine but the audio button you should uh, try to keep mute and uh, welcome to dennis uh, to this uh, digital floor thank you very much thank you matthew for for the invitation and for giving me the time and space to present this um, multidisciplinary research uh, first of all i just like to make sure that i'm heard well if you math you can uh, tune in to just confirm that would be great okay well i'll i'll go along with the uh, with the presentation um so i'll be sharing my screen um begin with all right so um as uh, matthew already said i'm interweaving um several disciplines and uh, i would like to make a disclaimer here that uh, originally i'm uh, an art historian i studied history of art at the university of glasgow and um throughout my my studies but also um following the conclusion of my studies i began to look to other disciplines such as urban theory architecture and social sciences to 
um, make sense of, of, of the world and the, of the reality because uh, to an extent the purpose or the, um, the aim of the curator is to tell stories. Um, and I think stories or even mythologies are informed by the built environment. And uh, coming from Cyprus, I noticed this uh, rapid uh, change and shift. And um, this is a story about um, the, these changes that have been taking place. Um, I would like to, um, all right, so. I would like to begin by uh, speaking about the title, acrophobia, which is um, a Greek word. And um, it, uh, it stems from uh, two words. So it's a compound word, agro and phobia. Um, phobia, I'm guessing you know already, is um, a fear. And it's the fear of abnormal, uh, or fear of heights, or the abnormal dread of being in a high place. And I chose this title because it serves a twofold purpose. Um, the economic crisis in 2013 can be considered as a plummeting, as a falling from a place we considered uh, safe. And on the flip side, um, the race to the top that we are experiencing now with many of us feeling that we're about to uh, burst, fall, uh, plummet to yet another crisis, be it financial, social, political, um, or ecological, or all of the above. To begin with, um, I'd like to say a few words about the island of Cyprus. As you can see, it's uh, very strategically located in the Mediterranean, in the Eastern Mediterranean, between West and East, uh, North and South. And this means that it has always been at the crossroads of uh, trade, travelers, settlers, and more notably, it served as a prize uh, for several Western and non-Western um, imperialist and expansionist projects. Cyprus gained its independence in 1960, while it is still divided between North and South since the uh, Turkish invasion of, of 1974. It is a Middle Eastern country, which is also part of the EU, and uh, that complicates uh, the geopolitical uh, status quo quite, uh, quite a bit. Um, it's been uh, part of the EU since 2004, and since um, 2008, it's been in the Eurozone. I'm giving you all this information just so that you have um, kind of a, co a context um, on which to, to understand the rest of my presentation. Uh, recently, there, have been, um, there, there has been a discovery of uh, natural gas within the um, exclusive economic zone of Cyprus. Um, which has prompted um, Cyprus to work along with uh, Israel and Greece to build um, uh, the East Met pipeline, so it's called, which will be the longest underwater pipeline uh, in the world uh, once completed. And um, on the island of Cyprus, there are still two um, military British bases. So following the um, Second World War, Cyprus experienced a rapid economic transformation. The island's agricultural economy, which was based on substance farming and animal husbandry, was replaced by a commercial economy centered in expanding um, the urban areas. The increased fragmentation of farms uh, through inheritance and a shortage of water caused many Cypriots to look for jobs um, in the urban setting and leave farming for good for full-time or part-time jobs in the economic sectors and in the tertiary sector. Um, this shortage of water, of course, made the, this transition um, easier. Um, and uh, seeing as the north part of the island is more fertile, but uh, was uh, and is under uh, still um, the uh, occupation, and it's uh, named the Northern Republic of Cyprus. Um, then the south had to kind of um, make up for it uh, for its economy. And here I wanted to share a, a painting by a pain, uh, by painter Cristoforo Sava, uh, one of the most notable Cypriot painters. Um, and as you can see, um, although Cypriot, um, the, the landscape is rendered cubist, which speaks volumes as to how um, Cypriot culture, um, since uh, 
well, many decades has assumed uh, other identities or has played with um, um, disguising itself as, as, um, as other. And um, as you can imagine, over the centuries, Cypriots and Cyprus have learned to become incredibly adaptable to new conquerors, to new ideas, um, yet uh, are still um, in many ways um, kind of um, close-minded and conservative to an extent. In uh, 2013, uh, Cyprus went through a uh, brutal economic crisis, primarily as a result of uh, Cypriot banks purchasing Greek government bonds uh, when, and handing out loans to overleveraged um, local property developers. Companies and private individuals uh, and state-level corruption uh, instigated or made the, made the crisis uh, made the crisis worse and the Troika um, decided or the, together with the state of Cyprus um, to cut 40% uh, of personal savings in accounts holding more than 100,000 um, euro to ensure that uh, the, the country and the uh, popular bank uh, um, like he, um, well, it's to ensure that Cyprus does not default and uh, this caused the popular bank of Cyprus to insolvency. While many private accounts in Cyprus, um, also tax haven, have been open to launder foreign dirty money, um, the EU wanted through this haircut also to flush, um, so to speak, most accounts belonging to citizens, um, who were non non resident citizens or bank account holders um, out of the out of the economy, out of the EU economy. Yet, of course, most of the bank accounts were held by residents who lost uh, most of their life savings. Sovereign debt today makes for 128% of GDP. And uh, it also has some unusual characteristics because uh, this the, Cyprus has the highest percentage of debt held by non-residents of all countries monitored by the, the Eurostat. Here I'd like to reference Italian sociologist and philosopher Maurizio Lazzarato, who wrote, who wrote in his book, The Making of the Indebted Man. And I quote, um, a society dominated by banking activity and therefore by credit uses time and expectation, uses the future as if all these activities were overwhelmingly calculated in advance, ahead of society itself through anticipation and deduction, end of quote. The magnitude of the 2013 crisis rendered sovereign debt into interiorized uh, personal debt uh, in a way stigmatizing Cypriots and uh, Cyprus uh, alike as yet another group of uh, irresponsible southerners um, while holding them hostage to the promise of uh, repaying the creditors. And to pay back the IMF and the European um, Stability Mechanism, the Cypriot government created, together with property developers, a citizenship by investment scheme in order to raise the funds. The citizenship by investment scheme requires an investment of a minimum of 2 million euro in property or other development projects ranging from golf courses, hotels, bars and luxury accommodation in exchange for a Cypriot passport. Quite a simple idea really. Developers are often given carte blanche and building permits are handed out without thorough or long-term assessments of their environmental and social impact. So with that choice, Cypriots uh, have been forcibly pushed into the scheme that will forever um, alter the sociopolitical and environmental um, uh, fabric of the country. Maritza Lazarat also explains, and I quote, that credit or debt and their credited debtor relationship constitutes specific relations of power that entail specific forms of production and control of subjectivity, a particular form of homo economicus, otherwise known as indebted man, end of quote. And here, uh, before uh, I share with you some of the visual uh, um, representations of what's happening in, uh, in Lemesos, in Cyprus, uh, also, uh, I wanted to share this uh, quote. Um, Architecture represents a religion that it brings alive, a political power that it manifests, an event that it commemorates, etc. 
Architecture before any other qualifications is identical to the space of representation. It always represents something other than itself from the moment that it becomes distinguished from a mere building. As much as uh, developers and the Cypriot government are promising that these um, shiny uh, new properties are beacons, whoop, sorry, let me check if this video is playing. As much as developers and the Cypriot government are promising that these shiny new properties are beacons of a prosperous and growing economy, to many they are but permanent reminders uh, of past mistakes and possibly catalysts for new ones. In addition to the exaggerated development projects underway, bear in mind that the whole island is littered by multiple unfinished properties due to insufficient funds or overdrawn loans or disillusioned individuals or developers. And the number of foreclosed properties has been increasing. Expropriated by the Bank of Cyprus, which in fact is the second biggest private real estate agent after the Church of Cyprus. I'm trying to play a video, maybe this can be I, done while I'm sharing. I think uh, it will not be simultaneously played. Um, I think the video has to be minimized on the desktop separately. Uh -huh, okay, all right. Yeah. So I guess this is where... Yeah, I can yeah. see the, the images right. are clear, yeah. Okay, all right. So the uh, Lemesis uh, skyline is mutating as 24 high-rise towers are under construction. A further 11 have been approved and nine more are awaiting approval. And all of this in a city of uh, 242,000 inhabitants. And most of whom do not have uh, even the funds or the means to rent or buy the accommodation. Since 2013, Cyprus has raised 4.8 billion euros from this scheme, and over the course of the last three years since I began working on Acroforia, a series of allegations of um, corruption and insufficient screening measures began to muddy the waters. Until the final blow hit last October, when Al Jazeera broke the headlines with a documentary proving that uh, secret officials including the Speaker of Parliament and the Member of Parliament were exploiting the scheme, um, offering a backdoor to criminals to launder their dirty money while receiving uh, citizenship uh, in advance, in, in return. Meanwhile, the European Commission has also launched infringement procedures against Cyprus for failing to comply with the European Union's environmental protection and uh, preservation directives. So while such uh, properties, um, like the one in the picture above, are left to crumble and decay as a result of um, overdrawn loans, loans, um, hundreds of millions uh, of uh, euro are poured into new construction projects that ultimately are a reiteration of these suburban ruins because they will most likely not be inhabited. They are simply investments, and if they will be inhabited, they will be for just a few times a year and for a very brief period of time, in a way, vertical uh, ghost towns. And remember that investors are not required to live in Cyprus. Yet uh, these development projects have permanently raised the cost of living uh, for the rest of the population. And when one is in debt, one will compromise their integrity in order to crawl out of it. Uh, but the thing is that with integrity and identity, uh, political agency, um, I find, starts to wear thin too, as the government itself is doing very little 
um, to control future inflation and speculation. So that has evolved over the years to uh, emulate growth. Economic anthropologist Jason Hickel makes a clear case in his recent book, Less is More, that the empirical evidence shows that it is possible to achieve high levels of human development without high levels of GDP. And in fact, the relationship between GDP and human welfare breaks down after a certain point and past a certain threshold, more growth actually begins to have a negative impact. Hickel references ecologist Herman Daly, who has confirmed that after a certain point, growth begins to become uneconomic. It begins to create more ills than wealth. I quote, we can see this happening on a number of fronts. The continued pursuit of growth in high income nations is exacerbating inequality and political instability, end of quote which is uh, certainly true in the case of Cyprus, which uh, over the course of the last few months has seen um, protests uh, massing uh, people to, in, in the thousands uh, and uh, public outcry at the level of corruption um, and at the level of um, nepotism that has uh, been plaguing the island. Pierre Pioneer, Edward Bernays, who happened to be Sigmund Freud's first cousin, who was a consumer whisperer and formalized the idea of controlling democracy through capitalism. In fact, he is uh, the one who transformed the definition of propaganda to public relations by applying Freud's theories uh, on our subconscious desires. Bernays was able to transform any product, any person, any idea to an object of desire for the masses, manipulating the mind to buy into anything. In 1939, at the very height of the Great Depression, he produced uh, the New York uh, World Fair under the theme Democracy, introducing the concept the customer consumer is king and portraying capitalism and democracy as interlinked integral to each other's survival, and as such, the pillars of a hopeful future. Presently aware of uh, the narrowing gap between sci-fi and reality at the time, they had invited companies to use storytelling to cast uh, their products as heroic enablers uh, of possibility in a future of uh, prosperity. One of the main venues of the fair was the Perisphere, um, as you can see in the picture a globe or a bubble, depending on how you interpret it now, uh, where visitors enter two revolving balconies um, circling above and around this utopian city of the future as demonstrated through a model. Growing upwards from the center, beginning with Centerden, Pleasantville and Millville. Uh, as outdated as these names uh, sound, the fundamental idea about marketing a better future life through um, models, events, fairs, museum talks, and uh, slogans hasn't changed much. Here I'd like to quote uh, Georges Bataille, who aptly writes in, uh, no, this is, sorry, uh, yes, who rightly, um, who aptly writes in 1929 in, uh, in Document, architecture is the expression of the very soul of societies. Just as human physiognomy is the expression of the individual's soul. It is, however, particularly to the physiognomies of official personages, prelate, magistrates, admirals, that this comparison pertains. In fact, it is only the ideal soul of society, that which has the authority to command and prohibit, that is expressed in architectural compositions, properly speaking. So the faces of economic crises are not always ones of destitution and, dis and despair. One uh, needs to look behind the smokescreen to determine um, how deeply rooted an economic crisis uh, is, and which is usually joined at the hip with a societal crisis. And here's an amusing, uh, albeit accurate, uh, take on a neoliberal urbanity dominated by excess uh, architecture, um, growth first ideology, and uh, market first uh, uh, mentality. Um, since I can't share it, maybe you can. Ah, okay, great.
Real estate developers are making many promises, both to their creditors and to their customers. Promises took form when real estate companies opened their offices just in front of the construction sites, uh, selling apartments even before the foundations were laid, using architectural models to communicate uh, the project's vision. I like to think of them as offices where dreams are sold. Their advertising campaigns are bombarding the city with cheap slogans trying to convince investors, the public and the general consensus that they're selling solutions. They will deliver what life ought to be or should be. Symbol of your success, uh, feel more before this life was ordinary, own your dream, a new way of life, define your future, we will have a better future, all these are some examples. The promise of dreams, growth, and an improved life. This is debt rebranded. This is um, economic crisis rebranded. Hans Christoph Inzwanger writes in Money and Magic that it is not vital to alchemy's aim in the sense of increasing wealth that lead be actually transmuted into gold. It will suffice if a substance of no value is transformed into one of value, paper, for example into money. Although we have been cautioned throughout history, political games, PR and advertising that most promises are empty, in this case the promises of a better future apparently is gold for Cyprus. And like any good art advertising agent can tell you, appeal to the customer's emotions, not their logic. Market logic dictates that when you're selling a product that is not unique, as is the case with banking, um, uh, accounting, and real estate, you need to consider that communication should solely appeal to consumers on an emotional level. Their hearts and not their minds. This is sometimes known as uh, an ESP, emotional selling proposition. An ESP can also produce an idea that connects consumers with the product through the advertising itself, without offering anything unique other than the ability to trigger an emotional response. A recent cross-national study on one million Europeans titled Advertising as a Major Source of Human Dissatisfaction and published in Economics of Happiness argues that increases in national advertising expenditure are followed by significant declines in levels of life satisfaction. And I quote, the defensive growth approach provides an affirmative answer. Defensive growth models not only emphasize the importance of the negative externalities that their growth process and the related expansion of market activity brings about, but also the important role played by negative externalities in fueling GDP growth. 
In fact, the erosion of environmental and social assets caused by increased market activity limits their accessibility, inducing consumers and producers to search for substitutes in the marketplace. This creates a self-reinforcing loop. The externalities generated by the expansion of market activities induce households and producers to defend their well-being by buying more goods and services, further expanding market activity. During this growth process, market goods and services progressively replace declining non-market sources of well-being as a consequence of people's attempts to compensate for the negative externalities generated by the increased marketization of society. Under these conditions, GDP growth goes too far in the sense that it is harmful, its harmful effects on well-being outweigh its benefits. Defensive growth is based on the idea that money is a defense, a real or illusory against poverty of social capital, against poverty of social capital. These multiple vertical micro islands are Cyprus's illusion of defense as they expand in all cardinal directions and occupy the majority of the seafront and replace could have been public, open, shared spaces for the community with often closed off, heavily guarded towers. Furthermore, commons such as beachfronts and natural reserves are being privatized and sold off. While walking on the Lemesos seafront, specifically what is called the tourist area, uh, I happened to come across several construction sites gated with tall metal panels pre presenting the finished outcome, um, enjoyed by its new residents in a state of blissfulness, calm and uh, comfort. They're playing tennis, sunbathing, doing pilates, having a glass of wine, enjoying time with their families, etc. Now, beyond the obvious effects these high-rise development projects will have on the environment, on the urban landscape, the demographics, and the gradual but definite creation of yet another real estate bubble, I think the most lasting side effect will be on the subjectivities of the local citizens who do not have the means to purchase this form of lifestyle, but are bombarded with slogans of a better future and images of a better future, and perhaps begin to associate happiness with luxury, and begin, of course, to desire it. Taking these maquettes as reference points for a successful and fulfilling life, fulfilling life and inviting the Cypriot public into a deeper hole of uh, conspicuous consumption. Perception of life is changing, as is our role within society, selling the indebted man more debt disguised as luxury, and as Foucault claims, self-exploitation begins to take place in pursuit of being self-entrepreneurial. Here I'd also like to mention that Cyprus faces a very serious gambling addiction, or many, many Cyprus face a very serious gambling uh, problem. Yet one of the, the biggest uh, casinos in Europe is being built in, in Cyprus currently. The American dream promises that income and consumption is the ticket to happiness. Yet if we look at the measures of overall happiness and well-being, it turns out that even these indicators have a tenuous relationship with GDP. This rather puzzling result is known as the Easterlin paradox, after the economists who first pointed it out. As you can see in the graph, life satisfaction begins to stagnate or kind of plateau uh, as GDP per capita increases. I'd like to quote uh, Jason Hickel again to give an explanation as to what this spike in the wealth gap that we see here in the graph uh, means for the separate society. And I quote, societies with unequal income distribution tend to be less happy. There are a number of reasons for this. Inequality creates a sense of unfairness. It erodes social trust, cohesion, and solidarity. It's also linked to poorer health, higher levels of crime, and less social mobility. It's also linked to poorer health, higher levels of, pardon, people who live in unequal societies tend to be more frustrated, anxious, 
insecure and discontent with their lives. They have higher rates of depression and addiction. Something similar happens when it comes to consumption. Inequality makes people feel that the material goods that they have are inadequate and we constantly want more because we want to keep up with the Joneses. The more our friends and neighbors have, the more we feel that we need to match them to feel like we're doing okay or that we are um, uh, accumulating um, the symbol of our successes. Credit and debt in its most elementary sense is a promise of payment. What is a financial asset, a share or bond? It's the promise of future value. Making a person capable of keeping a promise means constructing a memory for them, endowing them with interiority, a conscience, which provides a bulk work against forgetting. It is, it is within the domain of debt obligations that memory, subjectivity, and conscience begin to be reproduced. Lazzarato argues in Anti-Oedipus, Capitalism and Schizophrenia, Deleuze and Gattari <clears throat> mention Nietzsche's theory of debt within the earliest societies as outlined in his book, Genealogy of Morality. And within it, he outlines the human capacity to make and honor promises. And it is um, a very good guide to understanding debt. As Nietzsche explains in this early stage of human development, referring here to the penal colonies, if person A promises, if person A promises something to person B and then breaks the promise, person B is allowed to inflict pain on person A. Nietzsche concludes that what person B gains is the intense pleasure of making another individual suffer. In this compensation, we see the ancient contractual relationship between creditor and debtor, and that extracted pain is the debt repaid to the creditor. The production of scarification is indeed, Deleuze and Gattari write, what must be called a debt system or territorial representation. And I quote, a voice that speaks or intones, a sign marked in bare flesh, an eye that extracts enjoyment from the pain. These are the three sides of a savage triangle forming a territory of resonance and retention, a theater of cruelty that implies the triple independence of the articulated voice, the graphic hand, and the appreciative eye." End quote. The hippocampus is a small organ located within the brain's medial temporal lobe and forms an important part of the limbic system. It is associated with emotions, memory, and movement, and navigation, pardon, sorry. The hippocampus is involved in the formulation of new memories, as well as localizing objects and people. In fact, the ancient Roman Greeks developed the method of loci, first described by Roman rhetoricians such as Cicero and Quintilian, to help orators recount long texts. Neuroscientist Joan O'Keefe explains, in this technique, the subject memorizes the layout of some building, or the arrangement of shops on a street, or any geographical entity which is composed of a number of discrete loci. When desiring to remember a set of items, the subject walks through these loci in their imagination and commits an item to each one by forming an image between the item and any feature of that locus. Retrieval of items is achieved by walking through the loci, allowing the latter to activate the desired items. The efficacy of, the efficacy of this technique has been well established as is the minimal interference seen with its use. So if, if the hippocampus is where memory is ingrained, then we could suggest that perhaps that is also where death is ingrained, together with emotions of fear and perhaps pain, as Nietzsche outlined. And one can argue that people sharing a space also share a collective memory. Just as death manufactures subjectivity, so does architecture influence a way of perceiving and constructing identities and differences. 
Even Catherine Merlin Kinsey, who wrote the entry on their architecture for the second edition of the famous series Encyclopédie, published between 1751 and 1766, proposes a correlation between memory and architecture. He writes, among all the arts, those children of pleasure and necessity in which man has participated to help him bear the trials of life and pass on his memory to future generations, one cannot deny that architecture must hold a most eminent place. Even considered only from the point of usefulness, it surpasses all the other arts. It sees to the salubrity of cities, guards the health of men, protects their properties, and works only for the safety, repose, and orderliness of civic life. And in fact, Vitruvius uh, um, said that uh, being an architect is uh, being omniscient, so knowing all the sciences simultaneously. In the case of the Cypriot state, priorities lie with creating space um, exclusively for a private life rather than for a civic life. And I wonder what happens when the most prominent and largest parts of one's geographical surroundings are inaccessible. We cannot memorize the layout of a building if we cannot um, even enter or cross it. Therefore, these huge structures are incapable of hosting or accepting our memories. And they remain huge, tall colonizers of our imagination, always seen from the outside. Until one day, perhaps, after decades of remaining uninhabited, we will be invited to visit them as ruins. Italian architect Manfredo Tafuri's analysis of uh, architecture within postmodernism showed that to the extent that architecture can function in a capitalist society, it inevitably reproduces the structure of that society in its own imminent logics and form. When architecture resists, capitalism withdraws it from service, takes it offline, so that demonstrations by architects of the critical distance of their practice from degraded life become redundant and trivialized in advance. So I wonder what, um, what how we could predict um, the changes within the economy, culture, and, and uh, politics in Cyprus based on the architecture that is taking root today because so far the changes that are developing or are underway in Lemisol is uh, capital personified. And to what extent um, humans will um, uh, embody uh, or will continue to embody capital um, in turn. In this graph, um, um, Joanne Byron made um, a very interesting comparison between a 1959 report of urban planning in Cyprus with a contemporary planning and urban uh, report. And as you can see, the, for example, the densities and sizes um, have not been addressed since 1959. Um, there are generic references as to the green spaces that uh, could be planned or could um, take root uh, in, in public spaces, but also in, within smaller neighborhoods. Taxation and betterment levy has also not been addressed or a, a specific, no specific remedies have been suggested. Only participator in democratic planning has been taking small steps to transparency and open procedures after 2008. So there is still um, a great deal to be done in uh, reconfiguring, reimagining, um, and uh, reimagining on, on behalf of the, of the public, the city that they want to occupy and uh, getting it through to the, to the authorities because there is, there is pushback. It's just the political um, inability and, um, and corruption that uh, have been the main challenges to overcome. Debt is fluid and debt is disguised uh, and debt can be intelligent. And this is what a crisis looks like in Lemosos. The super government is blindly imitating cities uh, such as Dubai and New York because this is what uh, they consider as representations of a prosperous society. 
A lack of imagination can be interpreted as the blurred area of these three renditions that I found whereby all space beyond the limits of the future building is censored in a way, suggesting to the potential buyer that, and, or the passerby that beyond this border, nothing else should concern you or perhaps nothing else could be better. The selling point here is, look no further, all you want is right here. And these images aptly reflect the short-sightedness of free market solutionism, which is characteristic uh, of a neoliberal ideology. Haralambos Theo Bemtu, an MP of the Green Party, explains that usually high-rise development takes place where there is good public transportation. In Cyprus, with our lack of public transportation, I quote, the resulting high concentration of individuals in a small area will exacerbate the problem of traffic congestion, and consequently one must assume that pollution levels will rise accordingly. Also, Christos Haralambos has written on the devastating effects that deep foundations of these buildings, of these towers, will have on the surrounding fauna, already drying out as a result of the draining of aquifers. And you can see in the picture that these trees, um, many of the, tr the trees are now uh, suffering a lack of, uh, of um, uh, irrigation as a result. Frederick Soddy, radio, chem radio chemist Frederick Soddy called our biophysical stock of resources wealth and rightly knows that it is tied to the rule of thermodynamics. But money, which Soddy called virtual wealth, as we saw earlier, the illusion, is bound only by the laws of mathematics. Money can grow forever, natural resources and extraction cannot. This mismatch, Saudi claimed, is the root of most economic problems. Which brings me to the conclusion that in Cyprus, we are not only facing a financial crisis, but a crisis of the financialization of life, human and non-human, as a result of um, aggressive economic imperialism. The origin of architecture, its original state as a symbol, is found within the Tower of Babel, said Bataille. And I believe in the case of Lemesos, we are rediscovering the origin and power of architecture, all by being proud of being the birthplace of Neolithic and ancient civilizations and countless notable architects since. And despite the public outcry, protests, and the fight against the system, these towers are already underway. And I wonder whether in a, in a, in a dramatic or poetic uh, gesture, uh, they will be a, a storming of the, uh, of the Bastille, or perhaps in uh, 10 or 20, 30 years down the line, only for 100, these towers will serve um, as ruins. To, to visit as um, artifacts are exhibited in museums. To conclude, uh, I would like to mention John Heyduk, uh, a Czech-American architect uh, whose central theme in his practice was the development of the concept of, uh, of masks, architectural structures that embody a character specified more by the construction of relationships with other elements than by a specific identity and representing the problematic correlation between the human being and the symbols which they are supposed to embody. Other projects related to the mask intervene in places tied to a strong collective memory, but laying in a state of abandon. Heyduk uses the tool of the project to revive the figures that inhabit the place by putting them in a relationship with the contemporary citizens and thus projecting the side towards the future. The whole project is described by the architect as a construction of time, with some of the structures literally embodying the subject of the passing of time, like the clock turn table, the pendulum, and the cantilevered hourglass. If Heyduk had made a house for the indebted man or the indebted subject, 
perhaps it would look a lot like these skyscrapers or it could look like a bottomless pit. In any case, this is uh, another thread of uh, acrophobia that I'm developing. And uh, with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, give uh, the floor to any questions that you may have. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Uh, this was uh, very rich and uh, I was uh, going through the different uh, facets that uh, You've been pointing at, and this is um, a lot to lot a lot to think about, especially when you touch upon such aspects like uh, beyond uh, the the economics uh, into the mentalities, uh, the way in which uh, it manifests. Uh, the the materialities are are not too distinct from the mentalities as it is. I mean, the first image that comes to my mind is that of the ground zero, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, the what you ended with. What was there was a very tall structure, and uh, what is there now is an absence. But there is a relationship between these two. Uh, but it's an, it's from a different context altogether. But a lot of things follow afterwards. What we'll do now usually is we have uh, type questions that will be read out uh, for you, and uh, I will code them for you, Dennis. And sure. uh, uh, people can type the queries that come in as they come by. The, there mm -hmm. we already have a query by uh, Ramnath Regunathan. Uh, mm -hmm. Shall I read it for you? Yes. Uh, dear Dennis, that was very insightful. I was wondering what your views will be on the correlation of architecture, megacities, and standard of living versus the issues of income inequality and glaring disparities transpiring into the rise and perpetuation of slums an architectural mm -hmm. depiction of symbols of poverty and marginalization. Mm -hmm. Also, what would you consider to be equitable architecture or buildings versus skyscrapers in megacities and urban sprawls? That's mm -hmm. uh, Ramna Dragunar. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. I'm going to try and answer it because it was equally rich. <laughs> um, first off, um, I think I'm, I'm again not a, an urban uh, planner or urban theorist, but I think that um, whatever development project is underway or whatever uh, planning a city is uh, undertaken, it needs to consider the the environmental uh, the environmental um, um, capab not capabilities but um, character of of the place in which you're going to build. And um, I think this is the first step to building equitable cities, working with environment, uh, working with uh, materials that come from the country itself, so that you're not also um, in increasing your carbon footprint in the process, um, in, in addition to um, not uh, trying to segregate um, the, f the flow of people, but also not segregate the the cohabitation or let's say the cohabitation of buildings, because these towers are now being built uh, alongside seven-story buildings that were built initially in the 70s, and through the the drilling, these buildings, the older bu buildings, are now crumbling. So um, I think that in in the case of Lemesos. I would not consider it as a mega city. First of all, it does not have the population to to justify a mega city, and uh, therefore it's uh, quite bizarre that the architecture that we're imitating is of a mega city. So I would start uh, from that um, and uh, maybe completely uh, scrap the idea of a high-rise building and uh, work with. Uh, local architects and I'm sure some of them are uh, local architects but several of them are also mega architects that come from abroad that in a way impose a vision of um, of their architecture of their let's say neoliberal ne ne uh, urbanity on the city of Limassol and um, I would uh, begin perhaps with a public uh, referendum or a public vote 
on the ways in which the buildings um, can be used uh, and not just for high-end high retail and not just for uh, high, uh, fine, fine dining, but um, in a way separate the buildings or the plots into se segments that can serve various functions in various groups of people and um, also various incomes because the income uh, inequality in Cyprus is uh, increasing while the cost of living is incredibly high. So basic amenities are starting to become less and less um, accessible to, to several, uh, to, to, to most, uh, most Cypriots. Um, for example, many, many people are still living with their parents because they can't afford a flat of their own. Um, and uh, in, in uh, Barcelona, for example, where I'm at right now, each super block is divided by, um, let's say, a purpose. So there is a commercial purpose, there is a communal purpose, there is a um, uh, education purpose. And I think this would be an interesting way of thinking about it on a micro scale, of course, in, in Limassol. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Um, and uh, if I may go to the next uh, query, uh, this is from Abhinand Kishore. Abhinand asks, while listening to you, I was thinking of the state of Kerala. In the last five years, the state's total debt burden has been on an increase to 70%. And this is the state with highest number of financial institutions in India. Kerala's geography is environmentally vulnerable. And now it is pushing for more infrastructural activities like ports, bridges, flats, houses for poor, etc., designed by technocrats, uh, bureaucrats, and developers. Without representing the concerned communities, demands, and without assessing the environmental impacts that it make. That's uh, more like a, a comment from mm -hmm. another, another place. Yes, that's Abhinand Kishore. Yeah. So, would you like to respond? To yes, that? I'm. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the the question in the chat because uh, some of the words escaped me, Matthew. Mm -hmm. all, all right. Uh, should I read it again? For, or no, 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 no. I'm quickly reading it through. Uh, so, okay, I was actually wanting to ask what what um, what the urban uh, landscape is like in Kerala, and whether you see any of the things that I've mentioned um, replicated. So I see that you know technocrats <laughs> and bureaucrats and and uh, offshore corporate uh, businesses are in are also um, affecting the way that uh, yeah the urban urban development is happening and i was uh, wondering whether there have been any uh, pushback local pushback on 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 these uh, on these projects and in what to what extent are these foreign companies um or foreign agents working with um yeah local architects or local urban planners or if it's all planned ahead of time and externally or um, excluding um, the local population. Yeah. So, um, Dennis, uh, there is uh, one, one line that's a question. It's uh, with an exclamation mark. It says, well, any socialist remedies? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, can you think of any socialist <laughs> remedies? Any so ah, that's the uh, sorry. Okay, that's the end of the question. Ah, um, I think that uh, I would I would f look for eco-socialist remedies because um, the way that uh, Lemosos is now developing is both exploiting the natural environment and. Uh, widening the gap uh, of inequality. So I think in order to create just cities, um, the environment as well as the, uh, as the, the, the inequality needs to be uh, the exploitation against um, the, yeah, the environment and the inequality needs to be addressed. 
So I would start from um, examples that I've seen kind of spur that could be a great um, socialist uh, remedy, which is um, uh, farms that are run by families and they employ um, um, uh, friends or friends of family or um, locals to, to help on the farm. And uh, there is kind of like a, a downscaling of, uh, uh, of the economy and internalizing it and returning it to the commons. So I would say that uh, um, the vision for, for Le Mesos perhaps would be to uh, return the, the public domain from the private sector to the public because right now it's completely absorbed or in, in large part absorbed by private institutions and private profit and uh, private um, private gains and uh, although that the, the, although there are protests these projects are already on the underway so i it it's almost utopic for me to imagine uh, the possibility of um let's say eliminating these skyscrapers from from the city and instead maybe uh have a uh, uh, force the government to give parts of the skyscrapers or part of the towers to um, the service of the public good. So either, uh, you know, giving them out for 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 this is this is also a common um, claim in many big cities that there is so much um, empty space that it needs to be given to the homeless. First of all, uh, second of all, there are. Um, minorities that are excluded or further excluded from um, from the city as a result of these uh, developments and gentrification of course is um, just making the problem problem worse so I would caution you know the the perils of gentrification um, as a result of uh, foreign investment or the creative industry um, uh, coming abroad and uh, creating this uh, illusion of um, of public good, um, and yeah, at the end of the day, socialist remedies is grassroots in its initiatives. Um, yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dennis. Uh, so, shall I go to the next question? Yes. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. I'm, I'm just okay. also reading the... Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. So this question is from uh, Bijulal, and I'm quoting Bijulal. Uh, it was a serious description of a reality world over. There is a larger feeling that using the term slum, quote, slum dweller is discriminating. How do you respond to the cultural politics of naming lower income urban people as city makers? There is also another question that Bijulal asks. Mm -hmm. In the city politics context, how do you think capitalism and democracy are complementary to each other? Thank you. All right. So the first question, how do you respond to the cultural politics of naming lower income urban people as city makers? So referring back to my answer earlier, um, I think that grassroots initiatives are integral in socializing space or in returning space to the public and the I mean the the problems facing not just Limassol, uh, Limassol um, uh, the environmental uh, let's say perils that are facing us primarily the the rise of uh, the water levels which is something that I didn't mention now but imagine that the the, the water levels are rising and the uh, these skyscrapers are just uh, on the coast along with down the line um, or down the coast um, uh, neighborhoods of lower income households um, in in general there is um, very little being done uh, to incorporate or to re uh, 
to improve the lives of people who live in these neighborhoods. So um, I would, yeah. <laughs> All right. City makers, yeah. Yeah. And uh, capitalism and democracy are complementary to each other in this city politics. So, in you, you mean in, in the case of Limassol, or in in the case of in in general city politics? I guess so. Okay. Um, I think that. Uh, this is where neoliberalism comes in because neoliberalism is a free market ideology that reigns over the, you know, um, over, um, over the market. Capitalism per se is not, um, let's say, uh, absolutely bad, but the way that it has been utilized for neoliberal um, capitalism has uh, where democracy thin because uh, private uh, interests are taking over, well, are hand in hand with state interests. And this is where democracy starts to wear thin. Okay. Okay, Dennis, thank you. And uh, there is another um, clarification uh, as well from Abhinand Kishore, who has mm -hmm. asked a question, uh, a comment earlier. He says, sorry, that was not a question, but a comment. Kerala is only in the beginning of that process. The mm -hmm. problem is that in the context of the rising Hindutva fascism in India, mm -hmm. the, critique, the critique of a government led by left parties seems difficult. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. There is an uh, incredible pushback uh, against any left uh, leaning initiative in Cyprus and kind of um, um, so try, the, the government tries to stigmatize any kind of efforts in, in, in raising the, the issues that are result from the cor corruption, from um, police violence uh, to uh, it, blatant racism, discrimination, um, lack of, uh, absolute lack of human rights in, in processing refugees and uh, migrants' uh, paperwork. So uh, what I described to you today is just a facet of the, just a slice of the problem that is, uh, um, that uh, one of the problems that are unraveling in Cyprus right now. And uh, I have to say that the uproar that is happening now in Cyprus is much stronger than it was when the, the, the crisis hit in 2013, which is quite you know, impressive because the 2013 crisis really um, paralyzed the island. Whereas now the economy is not so bad, uh, and of course there are very strict measures to control the, the the, the population movement as a result of the pandemic, yet um, people are in the thousands are out in the streets and in a way regaining the right to protest and to voice their, their frustration with, with the government. Um, and, uh, and it's not a, an isolated case in Cyprus, of course, so that uh, right-wing governments are trying to silence um, any kind of opposition. It's widespread in Europe as well. Uh, shall I go to the next question? Yes. This is by, this is by Professor Shiba. Uh, she asks, to move away from the feeling of an overpowering capitalism mm -hmm. and the accompanying gentrification as a fait accompli, mm -hmm. where could we possibly locate the mobilization slash interest of the displaced in this scenario, mm -hmm. new imaginations of the urban question mark. That's uh, yes. Professor, Professor Shiba. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's a great question. Um, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, the current um, government is incredibly aggressive against any uh, micro most uh, migration or refugee migration and um, often really markets it in a way that is quite uh, dangerous 
um, aligning it to, to, to terrorism activities when there is, of course, uh, no basis for it. And um, the, the, the population of Cyprus, so the, um, the people in Cyprus who are tired of this, uh, let's say, system or this uh, framework are also trying to find ways of incorporating um, or fighting for the rights of, of uh, the displaced. And uh, I think it's a, yeah, it's fertile ground to think of new imaginations of the urban. And um, one thing that needs to be considered in the new imaginations of urban is how uh, to share um, the resources. So because we are an island and because we are, um, let's say, limited in our ability to, um, to, to extract more resources uh, than we already have, so we have to import uh, as a result, um, I'm wondering to what extent we can return to an economy uh, of, of exchange and in that way, uh, or use it as a way of reimagining um, urban space. So which uh, spaces can we can take over and use as common, common spaces, um, particularly in the old part of the, of, of the city where it's mostly pedestrian streets, the houses are small, and the community, many of the people who live there are um, let's say, open to um, more, uh, yeah, are more liberally minded. Um, and uh, the old part of the town is also closer to the um, part of the city that uh, houses the people from lower income households. So I would say that uh, behind the shoreline, behind the, 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 ta the, um, the row of towers, is a, a much smaller but a much more uh, vocal group of people that are trying to make do with architecture that already exists, but redistribute the buildings and redistribute the space that is available. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dennis. And uh, uh, now I think uh, this was uh, the last uh, question that has come in the chat line. And uh, when, uh, when, uh, when you're talking about uh, debt, I mean, I was just wondering, you know, because uh, sometimes it's said like, like after people like Graeber and all started writing, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there is in a way, there is no, there is no better way to describe uh, the kind of relationships uh, that are emerging in a, in a capitalist uh, frame. Uh, than uh, reframing them in the language of debt, you know, because that's like a, mm -hmm. a taken for, uh, I mean, that's usually not uh, um, anthropologically analyzed for the, for instance. And when debt becomes a normative kind of an order, when debt is the norm, mm -hmm. how can you have a space which is uh, an exception to that uh, normative order of debt? Or, uh, in other words, how can you have a uh, space which is different from the spectacular uh, presentation of debt, uh, which mm -hmm. is the norm. That's a, uh, that's a dilemma. Like uh, when I was reading Abhinand's question also, I was thinking about like a uh, space like Kerala, which is like a very small space within this large uh, ocean. Um, mm -hmm. how, can, uh, how can you have uh, a, 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 like a space of, uh, of uh, resistance so it's a it's a very tough question i was just thinking aloud um, mm -hmm. yeah so yes um i think a, a place of resistance uh, begins at the shoreline in a way because um not yet uh, it hasn't happened yet but it's gradually happening, happening not in the main part of the city, uh, but maybe on the outskirts where some of the beaches are being um, kind of privatized. And um, I think that uh, it's a it's a really striking um, it's a really striking development when the commons are, let's say, held hostage and your access to to the sea 
uh, to the water uh, is uh, is restricted, which is uh, actually something that's uh, happened in Beirut uh, when uh, I mean most of the, the stretch of the beach is uh, is privatized and held, holds by default the 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 citizen in debt or let's say holds them. Um, removes this human right to access uh, um, their their land, their land. So thinking outside the normative, uh, so let's say the status quo, which is indebtedness, drenched in indebtedness. Um, I would uh, advocate for uh, debt jubilee to begin with. <laughs> and understand or kind of speculate in a sci-fi scenario if there was a debt jubilee in Europe or at least in, in Cyprus um, what what would happen to the the land so the the beaches that are being privatized and to the structures that are being built now in order to pay off this debt because I'm pretty sure that this this construction project was just kick-started in, in the hopes of um, that many or the few that will that are part of it will, will gain a lot. Um, um, I mean, John Haydock's proposal, the the victims, I found it uh, quite interesting because because he allows the house or he builds the house to be lived in and understands the peculiarities and the characteristics of each individual. And uh, as comical as they are, his drawings or his architectural um, blueprints, I think they represent a very um, important uh, uh, aspect of non-homogenized uh, habitats. So these towers, as you can see, are just towers that uh, are really homogenous. Uh, one apartment looks like much like the other. And there's an erosion of identity. And this is what the death also does. It uh, kind of erodes identity. It homogenizes uh, all to comply with the, um, with the rhythm of, you know, work, sleep, uh, work, uh, work, sleep, uh, yeah. And um, uh, John Hiduk, on, in the on the contrary, imagines each house as collaborating with its inhabitant, uh, but living together. So I think it's, yeah, it's a, it's a poetic, let's say, take on um, non-indebted, non uh, indebted um, uh, house ownership. Yep. So, uh Dennis, uh, thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess uh, we have. There is. Uh, there is a hand raised. I, I think. Okay. Uh, that uh, that that was uh, raised for a while. Tamaf, uh, do you mean to ask a question, or uh, was it kept like that? Tamaf, as in, there's a hand raised. You can type in, or are you about to ask a question? Um, Dennis, okay. I think it was it was there for a while. Probably that was okay. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. And right. uh, I, I, we can take a couple more questions. Uh, there is time for that. Uh, but uh, if there are uh, no more queries, uh, what is uh, very interesting about uh, this gathering is that uh, lots of uh, people who would eventually associate with this uh, urban center who were there in the meeting, and uh, what are what we wish. And with, with me are some, uh, some research scholars who are actively pursuing very interesting research fields like uh, like Abinant and, uh, and Harissa. Uh, there are people uh, who are in this collective and we would like to network uh, friends like Dennis and uh, many of uh, the young scholars who have joined here, uh, people who have been in the field for a long time uh, into uh, both an online and offline uh, space, which uh, engages really engages with the with these uh, with these emerging ideas, uh, urban space, spatiality, and uh, spatial reconfigurations, uh, uh, and aspects like that. And uh, uh, for example, to put depth 
along with acrophobia, for example, was a completely novel idea for me because, you know, there is a way in which that represents a kind of a, a liminal uh, dilemma, liminal in the sense you are, if you, have, if you have a feeling that you're up there, mm -hmm. but you have a tension that you might, you know, there is no option for you to fall down, but you have the fear that mm -hmm. you might fall down. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's exactly what fantasies as products are, like what mm -hmm. Debord and, you know, those mm -hmm. uh, people who wrote of spectacles wrote about. There yeah. is the fantasy that you sell and resell again and again, mm -hmm. but there is hardly much option to stay out. Ex apart from what uh, Dennis and I had a discussion uh, earlier about uh, the degrowth or, you know, mm -hmm. those kinds of emphasis where probably you think a bit different from the normative. Uh, could, you, uh, could you share a few thoughts on uh, the degrowth idea? Because uh, that would be interesting because GDP is like a, relig like a religion. Yeah. You know? Yes, yes. Um, I, I came to, to, to the idea of including the growth in the presentation after, um, not from the very, from the outset, because it's a concept that I encountered or read about um, um, only recently. And I was introduced to it uh, actually um, through a scholar uh, here working in Barcelona at ICTA called uh, Joros Kallis, um, along with um, other thinkers and, and authors, uh, Ricardo Mastini and Jason Hickel, who um, try to place um, this obsession with the GDP growth uh, in perspective and kind of uh, analyze to what extent um, you know, the, the, this obsession is, is leading us down a sustainable, sustainable path. Um, of course, this um, contesting GDP as a measure of, as, let's say, um, a prosperous uh, society or prosperous economy is, um, is not new. Actually, the, the founder of uh, the, this mechanism um, warned against it being used as a, as a measure in the long run because it doesn't account for the costs of uh, human life, it doesn't ac uh, account for the costs of uh, environmental, uh, uh, ecological uh, exploitation and extraction, So, um, which are things that actually in, uh, make uh, social and political inequality worse. And, um, it's um, it's it's a it's not a novel thought because it's been around since the since the 70s. But in the case of uh, Cyprus, I felt it completely aligned with the way that I felt because it was so much height, there was so much uh, you know it, it growth personified that um, I started feeling like okay, what if we start to uh, reverse this uh, obsession with with height? Uh, and instead try and, uh, and dig uh, below, kind of speculatively and or just in, in imagination. And uh, seeing to what extent society would uh, survive if we were not uh, constantly chasing the GDP, uh, an increase in GDP, or uh, GDP as a, as a measure of, of uh, um, yeah, social welfare and happiness, because ultimately, um, uh, which is something that uh, Jason Hickel argues in his book, um, considering the this obsession, we can we can do without without this obsession, because um, the basic amenities and the social well-being. Um, can be covered by, uh, I think, uh, eight, eight to 10,000 US dollars GDP per capita. And meanwhile, maintaining, uh, or let's say, staying within our, our uh, ecological parameters. So, because ultimately this is what is going to be, you know, the end of us. If we're constantly over, if we're going to overstep our limits and, um, 
allow this um, the climate crisis to run its course <laughs> without uh, changing the way that we're doing things now, which is what has led us to this climate crisis. Um, yeah, we have no we have no sal salvation. So we need to do the opposite of what we're doing now, in a way. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dennis. And uh, I think uh, we will be um, closing now on that note. And uh, let me uh, tell you that it is very difficult to engage with uh, this uh, disruption, as uh, you hear probably a lot about in other contexts, but to engage with the uh, subconscious and desires and connecting mm -hmm. it with the materialities is not a not an easy task. The research that you're doing uh, would be definitely beneficial for uh, the kinds of ideas that we would like to engage with. And uh, I was uh, also uh, reminded, because this is also an island that you're dealing with, that uh, what Mike Davis uh, wrote a lot about, about this boundless enthusiasm for concrete and steel, um, yes. as, he, as he puts it. And it's like it's becoming, it's, it's running on something like an architectural steroid. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, so uh, the the presentation of uh, in in the mentalities as well as the materialities of urban spaces uh, through an acrophobic uh, 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 what is called metaphor of the big the bad and the ugly has been uh, has been uh, extremely interesting and thank you very much for being with us and I hope you could be in the collective on the long run and probably also eventually uh, when we have a more uh, um, you know real meetings uh, we could travel across and uh, engage with each other and thank you uh, thank you everyone uh, who, uh, who was here today and uh, because and also to end uh, who made this uh, this meeting uh, very lively and uh, we will be in touch uh, for all the further meetings and uh, please be with us and that matters for the urban center and the urban lab and thank you once again and uh, tell us uh, I thank, think we will thank you very much for having me Matthew and thank you to the listeners for staying uh, for staying throughout <laughs> and for your great questions as well so we uh, close today's meeting uh, and mm -hmm. uh, we'll be in touch for the further events thank you great thank you bye bye